the office this evening, folks. Uh, be sure to let me know if you have any issues hearing me, and if the mic's not quite in the right place, that looks good. You might notice that I had some slides running here before we started, and uh, these are some things I use with my students because a lot of people ask me how I got interested in women in the military. And I was in the Air Force from 1978 to 87 in one of the first classes in ROTC that let women in. So there weren't very many women around uh, in my years, and I didn't know anything about WASP or about any other women that had been in the military. It wasn't until later on that I started reading a little bit about this. Once I started reading, I was astonished, especially about the experiences of the Russian women, to see that not only had they been in the, women, in the military, but they'd been in combat. And yet you, you find that hardly anyone knows about these accounts. They don't know about these experiences of women. Uh, so when this comes around in a second, we'll get back to the slides that really made me sit up and take notice, like this unfortunate book. Um, yeah, this was somebody writing in the 1980s and claiming that women had never been subjected to the same standards as men, and yet you've got Russian women in World War II that definitely did exactly the same thing that men were doing. So I thought it was time for people to um, find out a little bit more of that. And especially when you have, at the time, one of the most respected military historians in the world saying really stupid things like, women do not fight and never, in any military sense, fight men. And yet people that go far back in history have said otherwise. So I was, I was interested in dealing with this dichotomy. How is it that some people say women never fought, and other people said, well, sure, they were doing all these things in combat. So that's part of what got me interested in the subject in general. But tonight we're just going to talk about aviation, which obviously has a special place in my heart. And I thought it would be interesting to compare and contrast a couple of key leaders here. Now, we're going to focus primarily on Jackie Cochran and Marina Raskova, but we're going to talk about a couple of others as well. I'm not going to leave out Nancy Love and some other people that uh, you might want to know just a bit about. And I thought I'd first bring up the question that sometimes is asked, uh, that I used to get asked all the time, and people would say, well, how do women lead? There must be some kind of women's style of leadership. Well, spoiler, I don't think there's any women's style of leadership. Uh, women have their own individual approaches to things. I think they're often constrained by their cultural uh, circumstances or what would be accepted in a particular time and place. But I certainly don't see any patterns that say there's a women's style of leadership uh, that's different from all the, the male leaders that I've studied. So we're going to look at the particular leaders and some similarities and differences they have. But I'm not trying to say there is anything that I would categorize as a women's style of leadership. So the two main figures that I want to talk about tonight are at uh, least Jackie Cochran, I think, is familiar to many of you. Uh, she's on the left here. And Marina Raskova is probably not. I don't think there's very much in English about her at all. There's a lot more in Russian, but it just has never kind of made the, the cut and getting translations done of her work, which is unfortunate because I think in many ways she's a much more interesting person than Jackie Cochran, uh, probably a lot more likable, and yet we find many similarities in the way that they become the leaders of their respective organizations. That caught my attention quite early on. Now we're not going to talk about those organizations in any detail, uh, but I wanted to just mention a couple of things to refresh your memory. One thing that people may not know about both the United States and the Soviet Union is that they had, before the war started, large reserves of pilots who were trained, male and female. And there were women pilots who had gone through training programs in the 1930s. Uh, there were more in Russia, but quite a few in the United States as well. And these often were exactly the same training programs that male pilots were going through. Many of the male pilots incurred a military reserve obligation in exchange for free training that was provided to them, but the women did not. They were not seen as uh, getting a pipeline for the military through this, but they had the same training as the men. Uh, so that's, that's kind of interesting. So when the war breaks out, you have in both countries hundreds or thousands, in the case of the Soviet Union, uh, of women that were pilots on some level. 
sorry. Um, the other thing I noted that I thought was interesting is that neither country had uh, arranged for any kind of mobilization of women in the military in the event of war. So when they decide to use women, it is very much an ad hoc decision. And there's no evidence that I've seen that indicates these organizations would have brought women into service had it not been for the effort of particular individuals, like Cochrane and Raskova, that uh, pursued that idea. So I think it's the vision and persistence of these key leaders that uh, really brought this about. I don't think otherwise it would have happened uh, in the way that it did. But it does, does still happen in a fairly hasty way in both countries, and that accounts for a lot of the issues that come up uh, in, in both of these situations. And just a few acronyms that are probably familiar to many of you. Um, so the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron, the WAFs, uh, this was a ferrying unit that Nancy Love was associated with. The Women's Flying Training Detachment, this is the one that most people think of when they think of the WAFs, where young women were getting training to bring them up to uh, certain standards. And then the two organizations are gonna be merged into the Women Air Force Service Pilots. So we're not gonna, again, go into the organizations tonight, but the leaders who are involved in, in those units. Now there's not an acronym for the Soviets because they don't have an organization. The women are just in the military. So they have units, but uh, they're not, they, there's no designation and none of those units was ever called a women's unit. There's no director of women's training, there's no similar titles in the Soviet Union. Uh, but we'll see that when we talk about Raskova. A bit more about the United States that affects, I think, how things develop there. One is that there's not much of a precedent in history for using women in combat or in the military in any role. There are a few women who fight in disguise in the Revolutionary War and later in the Civil War. Uh, when we bring women into the service in the modern era, it's as auxiliaries. So you have women in the First World War in clerical roles, in medical roles, but they don't have military rank and they're not performing military duties. Um, there are the yeomanettes, but you know, that was a brief-lived uh, way of giving rank to people that still were in clerical um, positions, and then they got rid of that after World War I to make it impossible for women to come in and be recruited directly into the military. So the, the U.S. was kind of averse to having women actually hold military rank or be a part of military organizations. So that's gonna be important in understanding what happens later. So no military status, and uh, when they do create units, they tended to be segregated units, as with the WAPs uh, and the WFTD, and even then there was infighting, as we see, between people that had different ideas of how those units should be used, uh, what kind of qualifications you needed for them, uh, and there was a lot of animosity uh, in, in the case of the United States. Things were a little different in the Soviet Union, which did have a long-standing precedent of using women in military roles. So there had been women in more open ways fighting in the military, uh, and, and more as far back, but in 1812, for example, uh, for the number of cases of women who fought uh, in that one. In the First World War, there were about 6,000 women that were in the military, and not just nurses, but doing combat positions as well. That went up tenfold in the Russian Civil War, immediately afterwards to 70,000 women, mostly in the Red Army. And then it went up tenfold again in World War II to 800,000 women in the Red Army. And it's pretty amazing to think about those numbers and how little we know of them. And of, of the 800,000, about half of them are at the front. So those are some of the big differences between the Soviet case and the United States. So let's look at how the uh, women bring them in. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, the, the Soviet Union did not generally segregate its women. They didn't form special women's units. They just were in the service, uh, doing duties alongside everyone else. Now, Raskova's units are gonna be a little bit different in their initial training, but uh, only one of those remains all female, and that's through some unique circumstances. So the dive bomber regiment, for example, uh, she initially recruited enough women for it when they were going to fly the Su-2. They upgraded to the PE-2 instead, which had a crew of three, and suddenly they didn't have enough people for the ground crews or the flying crews, and the only way they could expand was to bring in men into those roles. And then the fighter regiment also, all the Soviet regiments increased in size in late 42, so 
Uh, they didn't have women in a pipeline, they had no pipeline. So men came into that unit as well. So these were not called women's units, and only one ended up uh, during the war as all female, and that would be the night bomber unit. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, Jackie Cochran, I'm sure you know, is quite a fascinating character. Um, she would be the first to tell you so. And uh, she wrote her <laughs> memoir, which I think, like a lot of people, is one of the things you read that really inspired you and interested you in women in aviation in general. Uh, she, there's some interesting things that have come out recently. She was always very uh, cagey about her background and claimed to be an orphan and a lot of things that weren't quite true. Recent research indicates that her actual birth name is Bessie Lee Pittman. She got married, apparently, at the age of 13 or 14 in 1920 to Robert Cochran, had a son, apparently in the same year, uh, who died when he was five years old, and she divorced her husband at the same time, and then went off to New York and started a new life for herself. She kept his last name, changed her first name, and um, life went on for her quite differently from that point. It is a rags to riches story. She was born in poverty. And when she married her second husband, he was quite a wealthy man, and that enables her to pursue her new dreams in both business and in aviation. Uh, so that was um, a big shift for her. That always helps. Flying is an expensive sport, and if you don't have state funding like the Soviets do, then usually you need some kind of uh, assets to be able to participate. So that was a bonus for her. <coughs> She quickly established herself as a true aviation pioneer. Uh, Cochran in the 1930s uh, just set all kinds of records and firsts. And she was friends with Amelia Earhart. She was probably the best known female pilot, second only to Amelia Earhart. They were both in the Bendix Trophy races. She was the first to win, the first woman to win uh, a Bendix Trophy race. She was the first woman to fly a bomber across the Atlantic because she kind of screwed over Nancy Love. Uh, she won five Harmon trophies. She was very, very interesting. So she did earn a great deal of fame, and that led to political connections as well, and her friendship with the Roosevelt's uh, that you may have heard of. She was a driven personality, I would say. And so one of the people who knew her said, ambition vibrated through every word Cochran spoke. I think that applies both to business and her flying. Another said she outworked everyone, everyone else around her in all aspects of life. And yet another of the Wasp uh, wrote about her, I had the feeling she would head toward her goal like the proverbial steamroller, heedless of obstacles in her path and oblivious to squashed forms that lay in her wake. <laughs> Still, if that was what it took, to achieve her visionary schemes, maybe then that's what it took. Uh, people had some interesting opinions of her. <laughs> so how does she get involved with these women's units at the beginning of the war? Uh, when the Germans began to occupy territories in uh, Europe, that gets a lot of people's attention. So already in 1939, she uses her connection with Eleanor Roosevelt to write a letter to suggest that maybe they could start bringing women in to free men up to fight. So that there were women pilots who could come in and take over non-combat duties, and that would uh, be beneficial. That didn't go anywhere. Uh, and by the way, they'd be commanded by her. Uh, in the summer of 1941, she wrote again and talked to uh, FDR and got his support and asked him to open some doors for her around the Pentagon. So she got this title of um, tactical consultant for the Ferrying Command. She was able to go around and see various military leaders in the Pentagon and try to convince them that uh, there was a use for women pilots in their organization. And we see very early on this uh, choice between what we mean by women pilots coming in to serve with the military, not in the military, but with the military. Cochran advocated large numbers. The Ferrying Command, we'll see when we come back to Nancy Love, was already looking at using small numbers of very well-trained pilots who could immediately jump into the cockpit 
Cochran said, we've got an awful lot of women that just need more training than that. They've got the basics, and we need to provide for that, and then we'll have a whole lot of them, a whole lot of women available um, that we wouldn't otherwise have. So you have this argument between Cochran and Love about the large numbers and the small numbers. Uh, so Cochran thought that the standards for the uh, Fair Aid Division were too strict, even though the standards were set up for male civilian pilots as well. Uh, that you know, we needed to open more doors for the women. So she was she was in conflict with the Fair Aid Division right off the bat, and not a lot of people were necessarily convinced about the utility of this idea early on. So her pr proposal was rejected. So 41, nobody was buying any of this. Uh, and then things go in stasis for a little while. Could not get that one to come in ahead of the sub point. Don't ask me why. And Jackie goes off to England. Uh, it's suggested that she could go over and take a group of American women who wanted to have volunteered to fly with Air Transport Auxiliary, which was a group of ferrying pilots, both male and female, and that Cochrane then could see if this was maybe something that could work in the United States. So she goes to England, um, makes a few more enemies over there, if you know any of those stories about her showing up with her fancy cars and fur coats at a time when England was not in great shape. Um, but she flies well, and she does find out you know, that the women are performing well. So she, she's looking at that model, but then things start happening back home in 42 in the ferrying division. Nancy Love's proceeding with trying to get some of these experienced pilots into the cockpit. Uh, Cochran gets very upset about that. She holds a press conference and says, I've been called back by General Arnold to be head of a women's air corps in this country. Uh, we don't know if that's true or not, because Arnold denies everything. But uh, we do know that by the end of the year, the Air Force, uh, such as it is at that time, is embracing the large numbers concept and not the small numbers concept. So, what you have in 1943, Cochrane gets the title of Director of Women Pilots. What does that mean? Nobody knows. But a month later, she gets control over both the WAFs and the WFTD, and now they're merged into the WASP, and now Nancy Love is subordinate to her, and she adds a provision that all these women uh, in the ferrying division, from that point on, would have to go through the WFTD program, regardless of what their qualifications were. Even though you had women pilots with over a thousand hours who'd been flying heavy aircraft, now they're all going to have to go through Jackie's training program before they could qualify. Uh, so uh, that's that was an interesting development. Uh, let me also say, let me see if I've got a bullet for this one. No, we're not at the experiment yet. Uh, I wanted to throw out a couple things I, I read about Cochran as a leader. She had been a businesswoman and a pretty successful businesswoman back in the 1930s. She was definitely a mover and a shaker. And she ran the WASP like it was her personal empire. That didn't sit too well because it didn't really fit the military chain of command idea. Uh, so she established her role as a free agent. She operated independently of the military chain of command. No WASP could be hired, fired, or used in any way by any agency in the military without going through Jackie. That's not the way things usually work in the military. Uh, so uh, that was rather unusual. She was authorized to consult directly with the commanding generals of a variety of commands. Uh, and the air staff later on wrote about this and said, uh, her leadership was aggressive control, which was out of keeping with the traditional role of a staff officer. Now, we all know that sometimes you have to operate beyond the boundaries to get things done. But if you make too many enemies, it becomes easy to get rid of you later on, too. And I think this played into what happens in 1944 and the failure to militarize the laws. Uh, the other thing I want to mention about Jackie was the idea that this was all an experiment. From the get-go, she clearly stated in her own memos that there were two purposes for these women to be serving the military. One, to free men to fight, and second, as an experiment to see whether or not women could hack it, basically. Can women fly the same kinds of missions that men would be flying in the military? So it was always regarded as experimental. Let's see, that's quite different in the Soviet Union. Um, so an experimental, gender-segregated unit was something that was like a growth on the 
body of the military underway, it just didn't fit in. And it was easy to cut out when they were tired of it or didn't need it any longer. It didn't fit in well at all. Uh, and, and that's unfortunate, I think. Um, you know, the, the, when the Army Corps was militarized, and when the WASP came up in 1944, they were not. And, you know, there's a lot of things you can read about why that is. But I think because of the nature of this organization, it was easy uh, for Congress to reject it and for it to then just be disbanded. And, you know, those women that had sacrificed so much are sent home at Christmas of 1944 with no job and uh, no future in the military. Jackie had a future, however. Uh, Post-war, she continues to set records, and it's pretty impressive. She actually gets a position in the reserves. In 1948, they uh, give her a lieutenant colonel's rank in the reserves, so she gets that. She continues to set world records, the first woman to break the sound barrier, the first woman to take off and land from an aircraft carrier. She's still out there in the 40s and 50s doing really impressive things. And the Smithsonian says that Jacqueline Cochran held more distance and speed records than any pilot in history, male or female. I don't know if that's true, but since Sonny had said so, I'd say there's a pretty good chance. There were a lot of controversies about her, not only about her leadership style during the war, but about her attitude towards women after the war. And I think maybe some of you know a little bit about those controversies. I think that was that's where I first started hearing about her. Um, there was some of it when they were looking at giving the WASP veteran status in the late 70s. She was not a big advocate of that. Uh, she also had an ambivalent attitude towards women as astronauts and as uh, commercial airline pilots. And in fact, uh, she testified against training female astronauts in the space program. And she opposed the women's movement. <laughs> what do you do with that? I mean, somebody that was such a pioneer of bringing women in flying military aircraft in the way that she did, and yet then just throws them under the bus after the war is over. Um, you know, I don't think we can understand her motivations entirely, but it's, um, it's puzzling to say the least. So I made a word chart here. I pulled adjectives that have been used to describe Jacqueline Cochran from other people's memoirs and letters. So these are all terms that people who knew her used to describe her. I'll just give you a second to take that in. Out because you know strong women are often seen as brash and egotistical. Um, but I think for me the center stage one kind of captures a lot of what she was about. I think it's just my own opinion, but I think Jackie kind of wanted to be the only woman in the room, and I that's just my opinion. Maybe I'm a little biased because I know a lot more about Maria Raskova, who's quite a different person. Uh, so Raskova is on the right here. We'll talk about that aircraft in just a second. But there are some striking similarities between these two. So in terms of what was going on before the war started, Raskova is six years younger than Cochrane. She also had a very young marriage. She was about 18 or 19 when she got married. She also had a child right away. She also got divorced five years after her marriage. So Raskov was her husband. Uh, that was not her maiden name. Uh, her daughter lived, however, uh, and you'll see her in, in a minute. Like Cochran, she also did many groundbreaking things, and her name was famous all over the Soviet Union and in the West. Western newspapers wrote quite a bit about her in the late 30s in particular. So she could justly be called uh, a pioneer. In 1931, she started work at the prestigious Zhukovsky Academy uh, as a drafts person. And then by 33, she became the first female navigator in the Soviet Air Force. In 1934, they put her on the staff of the Zhukovsky Academy as faculty. Uh, she has military rank. And then she goes on a whole series of world breaking, uh, world record breaking flights in the 1937 to 39 time period. Now, one interesting thing about Raskova, she does have a pilot's license, but she's primarily a navigator. There were 
very, very few good navigators. Navigation was really a new skill at this time. So she was far more in demand as a navigator and not really known as a pilot. So all of the world records she sets, she's the navigator for other people who are the pilots that she flies with. So her most famous mission was in 1938 and the flight of a Rodina, that's what this aircraft is called. Uh, anyone know what Rodina means? That's the motherland. And if you've ever seen that big statue at Stalingrad, Mother Rodina holding up her sword, you know, that's Rodina also. So they set a distance record. Let's see, they flew 3,695 statute miles of straight line distance in 26 hours and 29 minutes. That broke the women's international straight line distance record by more than 900 miles. Uh, they flew clear across Russia. And what really made it interesting was they ran into bad weather because it wasn't easy to predict these things in those days. They got iced up and they had to make a, a forced landing. And to do that, Raskova had to jump out to lighten the aircraft, so she bailed out. And they are way the hell out in the Far East. Uh, it's like, you know, somebody, uh, the, the other pilots, Grisadova, and Osipenko, uh, they land the aircraft some distance away from where Raskova came down. So she came down in the taiga, um, damaged her leg in the process. She's jumping out with like a candy bar and, and almost nothing else on her. And she's out there for 10 days. And this is in September and October. It's pretty cold. And so the search crews are out looking for them, but this is like trying to find one plane in all of Alaska. It's really miraculous that they do finally find the plane. The other two women stayed with the plane. They located that. Raskovo hobbles in, and they finally get them all back to Moscow. They were the heroes of the country. They were all awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union Award, which was a, a new award, but roughly equivalent to our Medal of Honor. Uh, so they were known all over the Soviet Union. Their names were on everyone's lips, and uh, they were famous just as Cochrane and Earhart were famous. And these pictures show you a little bit of what that's like. So here's Glasgowva in 38. That's her in the center photo in the white beret. You know, people just admired, adored, and assaulted her everywhere she went. And the book she wrote just weeks after she got back is called Notes of the Navigator. You know, it's a small uh, book, but it, it gives the whole story of what it was like for them flying that mission and then you know, trying to survive in the taiga. I mean, so, you know, that's just the stuff of legend, and she was a legend to many people. So there's the Raskova with her daughter Tanya. Uh, so the role at the beginning of the war, Raskova is in the military, highly placed in the military. She had, uh, like the other women, been invited to the Kremlin, she knew Stalin, she had a lot of pull. She could have done anything she wanted. And Griza Dubova does. For example, Griza Dubova doesn't want anything to do with women's regiments. She gets command of an air transport regiment that's all men and flies partisan resupply missions throughout the war. So Raskova could have done something like that, but she was getting hundreds and hundreds of letters from young women who said, I'm a pilot, I want to fly like you, what do I have to do? And these women, when the war broke out in June of 41, had been volunteering and turned away because they weren't taking women pilots at that time and they kept telling them all to go be a nurse. So she took her briefcase full of letters and started making the rounds uh, of the military leaders. And it took her a while to, to really get um, a hearing on this, but finally she was able to persuade them that they needed to use these highly qualified women. And, um, she made a speech in September of 1941. So she'd been going around for a few weeks trying to sell this idea. Again, didn't have a lot of success at first. And here's just one little part of the speech. It was broadcast on the radio. It was printed in newspapers. Everybody knew the speech. This is the kind of thing that young people would cut out and paste in their notebooks, you know, along with their picture. But I thought this, this little statement was really interesting. So she says, the Soviet woman, she is the hundreds of thousands of drivers, tractor operators, and pilots who are ready at any moment to sit down at a combat machine and plunge into battle. 
Dear sisters, the hour has come for harsh retribution. Stand in the ranks of the war. Not a military rank. Meshlaspe warriors. But that's what she's after right from the get-go. And that galvanizes young women even more. Uh, they want a role. So uh, she gets approval for her plan. I would say this is more a small numbers plan. Although the regiments that she founds turn out to be about a thousand women, which is roughly the same numbers in the WASP. Uh, but those aren't the only women in the Soviet military by a long shot. Um, there are other women who are already flying right from day one. They're already in the military. Not a whole lot of them. But she thought they needed their own organization, that she could get them into combat faster, they wouldn't be sidelined, they wouldn't be um, you know, mistreated by anyone, and that was why she thought it was better to have segregated units, at least until they got to the front. So, uh, she gets approval to train these regiments up, and there are going to be three regiments, as you see. So here's the order signed by Stalin, 8th of October, 1941, and it authorizes the formation of three regiments, regiments about the same as a squadron for us. Uh, so there's a fighter regiment, gets the Axe Series fighters. There's the dive bomber regiment, which ends up, starts off with the SU-2, but then gets the PE-2, uh, much more sophisticated. And then the night bombers uh, flying the U-2 biplane. Now, another misconception, by the way, about these night bombers, there were lots of men flying night bombers. This was not something that only four pathetic women pilots did that got the dregs of all the aircraft. Uh, the Soviets were, flying, were throwing everything they had at the Germans. And they had all these biplanes that could be pretty effective in a harassment type role. And so they were using those from day one. There are lots of male night bomber regiments. And maybe later we can talk about night witches. So these three regiments went off uh, to a training base, got themselves trained up, and each unit then started going off to the front, the fighter regiment went off in April, the night bombers were next, and then the dive bombers, the PE-2, were last because of the change in equipment, and they had to retrain and bring in new people, and Raskova chose to be commander of that regiment. So once her role was done directing training, she was going to combat with this regiment, and the other two had their own commanders we'll talk about in a second. It's a pretty impressive airplane, isn't it? This was latest and greatest technology. So again, the idea that women only got the drags, you know, that they, they got yak fighters and they got PE-2s as well as those fire planes. Not an easy plane to fly, by the way. Unfortunately, Raskova never made it to combat. As the 125th, well, at the time 587th, uh, was being transferred from the training base and they were going down to Stalingrad, where they did their first missions in January of 1943. Raskova was bringing along a couple of aircraft. The weather was really bad. The unit had gotten strung out over a period of a couple of weeks. And so she stayed with the last aircraft uh, coming in. And those three were trying to catch up to the rest of the regiment. And she was killed in a blizzard. They all had to make forced landings, but everyone on her plane died. Um, there's some interesting things we could talk about with that event, too. You know, people that have accused her of uh, being a poor pilot, and some other things that I, I think, you know, I, I could give pretty good evidence that that was not the case, that it wasn't pilot error. Um, in fact, Pat Yakov, who designed the PE-2, died in a crash, in a blizzard, in January of 1942, a year before. <laughs> and he wasn't the only one. So, you know, bad weather, sophisticated aircraft, you know, there, were, there were other people, so I don't think it's quite fair to uh, suggest it was just pilot error. It is, however, tragic. Let me show you the word slide I made up for Raskova. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback on this mic. Maybe I should point it a different way. So again, these are all things, and in this case, I interviewed, well, I actually interviewed people that knew Cochrane too, but I, I interviewed a lot of people that knew Raskova. Uh, and this is from memoirs and letters and interviews. Uh, 
comment about her. And this is not in the vein of the usual, you know, Soviet propaganda type thing. These are obscure letters and memoirs, uh, and people I talk to directly. She just seemed to be a really wonderful person. So it, um, she's described as being soft-spoken though firm, and beloved by her subordinates to the point of idolization. I think you'd say that about her. Um, one of her deputies described her as gentle and tactful, and said, I don't remember a single case when she yelled, or even raised her voice, or rudely interrupted a subordinate. Her method of education was persuasion. She never punished anyone in a fit of temper. Her self-control was enviable. Not every leader had such capability and talent. And she also had a sense of humor, and she was a great pianist. Now, from what I've seen, I'd say that Nancy Love is more like Raskova, or Raskova like Love, than either of them is like Cochrane. Uh, Nancy Love doesn't get enough attention, I think. She was not the kind of high profile celebrity flyer that the others were, but she did set many firsts in her own right. She was 16 years old when she got her pilot's license. She went on then to start a group of student flying clubs. She got her commercial license in 1933, and she was described by a number of people as being a pilot's pilot. She led by example. She didn't call a lot of attention to herself. So she's a fascinating character. She was a civilian employee of the Ferrying Division, and that was uh, the, so she worked within the chain of command, trying to bring in qualified women, because she knew there were plenty of women out there who could do a good job in ferrying, and other men could go into combat instead. She also made proposals to bring those women in, as we've kind of indicated already, and eventually ended up with the title of, uh, what the hell is this, executive of women's pilots of the women's auxiliary ferrying squadron, uh, but she was subordinate as well. And I don't think she was terribly happy about that. Love was certified, I mean, so the subordinate to uh, Cochrane. She was certified in 19 military aircraft. She was the only female pilot we know, I don't know if they're men, to be certified in every military aircraft of her day, including the C-54, B-17, B-25, and the P-51. Uh, so a very, very capable pilot. And I want to tell you briefly about a couple more women that maybe we should know more about. <laughs> These two are really fascinating. Uh, so the, the commanders of the other two squadrons, Tamara Kazarinova was the first commander of the fighter squadron, and Yevdokia Vershanskaya was commander of the night bombers. They were as different as you can imagine in every way. And Kazarina was a mystery. She and her sister both seemed to have been foisted on Raskova. They were kind of old school party members, the kind of women that cut their hair short, wore leather jackets, and smoked all the time and tried to look as much like the communist ideal as possible. Not women's ideal, but um, you know, old school communists. And uh, Raskova put off and put off and put off naming a commander for the fighter regiment. I think Kazarina was pushed on her for political reasons. It certainly doesn't seem to be anything to do with her capabilities. She was a military pilot, but I can't find a damn thing about what she ever did, except get an award for probably informing on people. Um, <laughs> she never flew when she got to the fighter unit, and that fighter unit had some of the cream of the crop pilots that the Soviets had, women who went on to become fighter aces. She was despised by the pilots. They, she was deemed responsible by the higher command for a fatal accident that happened in her squadron for setting up a very good pilot who'd already shot down a bomber and getting her killed. And she was transferred to staff duty after that. And from that position, she tried to sabotage everything they did. Um, so not a great example of leadership, I think, by any standards. Yuvdokia Vershanskaya was quite different. Now, the interesting thing about her is she would not have been on anyone's list of most likely to succeed. She was a capable civil aircraft pilot. Not a leader, she didn't want to be a leader. She wanted to be a fighter pilot, and she kept begging Raskova to let her join the fighter unit. Raskova saw something in her 
and twisted her arm until she agreed to take command of the night bombers. Nobody wanted to be in the night bombers, you know, flying an open cockpit biplane all year round in Russia. Are you kidding? You know, practically no armor. I mean, that, that's just, you know, not anybody's first choice. She didn't want to do it, and yet, she became one of the best commanders out there. She was unorthodox, she was innovative, she could be judged the most effective, her regiment won the most honors, produced the most heroes of the Soviet Union, and flew the most combat flights. And later on, I came across something just a year or two ago uh, that named the 12 most remarkable air regiment commanders in the whole Air Force of the war, and she was one of them. Uh, so I think she's, she's a very interesting person and worth knowing a little bit more about. And uh, there's some pictures of the Night Bomber Regiment. Now, nobody wanted to fly that plane, but there were people that had more than a thousand missions in that plane. There's no going home after 25. You're flying every night as long as it's dark. Sometimes, and because they flew very close to the front lines, they don't have much of a range. Uh, they could fly 8, 10, 12 missions a night. I want you to imagine coming home, turning, you know, getting re-equipped and re-armed with your puny little bombs, maybe getting a cup of hot tea, and then going right back out again. So th th these are definitely people to be admired, the women and the men who did this. Uh, one last quickie I want to throw in here. These are not leaders per se, but again, uh, it shows you my fascination with compare and contrast stories. I came across these German pilots, and some of you may know, um, of maybe of, of Hannah Reich, probably not, Melinda Schiller is, is, is well known. Um, Hannah Reich is another one who wrote a memoir that was very inspiring. When I first read it, I thought, here is a really interesting, fascinating woman. She won the Iron Cross, she performed at the Olympics in 1936, um, in her aircraft, she did all kinds of interesting things as a pilot, and survived the war, came over to the United States, met the Kennedys, uh, became kind of an international hero. She was a true believer who was ready to take the pill with Hitler. She was in the bunker in his last days, offered to die with him. He ordered her to leave because he wanted her to fly out uh, another general that he wanted to, to save. Uh, but, um, the picture kind of captures uh, what Hannah Reich was about. Melinda Schiller, on the other hand, was a fascinating woman, very capable, very well educated, a fabulous test pilot. You might guess by her married name, she was married to the brother of Klaus Stauffenberg. That's a name that might be familiar to some of you. Have you seen the film Valkyrie? Okay, the Stauffenbergs, who were at Klaus was one of the centers of the plot against Hitler. Well, Melinda was going to be his getaway pilot mm -hmm. because she had access to aircraft and could land anywhere, could fly him out. So if he didn't have a getaway plane, she was in on the plot. Nobody ever talks about that, <laughs> but she was in on it and she was going to get him out if he needed to call on her. As it turns out, uh, he didn't need her on the day, but of course he ended up uh, getting executed. Most of his family, including her husband, ended up in prison, and she used her influence to keep them fed. Klaus's wife, uh, who ended up in prison, was pregnant. Melita made sure that the child was born and taken care of. She did everything to keep his family safe. Now here's two other remarkable things. She was part Jewish. <laughs> and she'd gotten an exemption from the party as equal to Aryan because she was so valuable as a pilot. She also got the Iron Cross, by the way. The second thing you might want to know is she was shot down and killed by an American fighter pilot as she was flying an unarmed plane going to visit her husband in prison. It just ain't right. So I did a story for a Military History Quarterly, and I think you can download that PDF from my website. If not, you can email me and I'll, I'll send it to you. So they're not leaders, but again, I think they exemplify the very different qualities that individuals can exhibit in wartime, even people doing very similar jobs. So uh, these are the planes that those two women flew. 
I would argue that Schiller had a more impressive record in military aircraft. But to wrap up, back to the Cochrane and Raskova, I tried to kind of boil this down to what would be some common characteristics that they might share and some differences. And these are things I think are pretty similar. You know, almost anyone in aviation has that dream of flying. I don't think, you know, early marriage and young mothers really means anything. The other women weren't in that category, but it is an, an odd kind of coincidence for them. Um, they were definitely pioneers who were famous, who had lots of clout in the highest circles of society. They both believed they were fighting a just war. They both were ambitious, certainly in the organizations they wanted to create. And they did have support of enough leaders that they were able to get their plans accepted. So you can certainly find similarities. Uh, I think maybe the differences are more important. Cochrane was only looking at training in non-combat roles, whereas Raskova, of course, was looking at women going straight into combat duty. Cochrane more a pilot, Raskova more a navigator. Cochrane civilian, Raskova military. Their personal styles were radically different. Cochrane saw women as replacing men, freeing a man to fight. That was not the idea in Russia. These women were just out there fighting like everybody else. And then the idea that there's an experiment, that was not a term used in Russia either. Uh, so to conclude, there, there's a lot of similarities that might surprise people in these organizations in the United States and the Soviet Union. The rough size, the dates, uh, the way that they came about using political clout from, from the end, kind of outside the normal channels in some ways, um, can, can be said to be similar in both. As we talked about, neither country had a plan for mobilization or particularly wanted to use women, but these women made it happen. So in both nations, it was individuals and not the military establishments who took the lead in proposing that these organizations be created and developing a plan for the use of women. And I think it seems unlikely that that would have happened without the efforts of people like Marina Raskova, Nancy Love, and Jackie Cochran, who could hardly have been more different in their personal leadership styles. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you. 
Um, she wasn't the only one to do that. There were a number of other women who left children behind because they felt it was more important to do the fighting in Russia. I'm not sure, you know, in America we criticize people who do that, but you know, you have to understand what was happening in Russia and the, the, the you know, mass occupation and the horrible atrocities that were going on. So many women did that, made that choice. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that the, the German army referred to the, the women pilots in the night bomber units as the night witches for a number of different reasons. And I thought one is which you mentioned, and I had heard this before, that they would fly very, very, very low. And at one point in their attack scenarios, they would actually idle the engines and the sound that the engine would make, the kind of the wick, 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 and the rumors would, would flow throughout the German armies that it sounded like broomsticks, and so they would start to refer to these women as the night witches coming to bomb them. I'm glad you asked that question. This is something I've been trying to track down for a long time, uh, because you know it just makes one of those great headlines um, so let me just point out a couple things. It's very difficult to prove. You know, I certainly haven't found stuff in writing to prove the Germans did this. Remember that there are dozens of night bomber regiments all across a 1,200-mile front. This is just one. How, in the dark, would the Germans know there were women in those airplanes? I don't know when the term first came about. The women themselves are not thrilled about that title. <laughs> Especially if you know, Germans call them Nachthexen. The male bomber, night bomber pilots feel pretty slighted to know that they don't get that kind of attention. Because <laughs> they were doing that hard work too. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't say it can't be true. I'm just trying to figure out how it would be true. You know, they might have seen a couple of newspaper stories and, but who knows that they were ever in the same place at the same time as these women. And there's some really bad Russian movies on Amazon right now that please, please, I can tell you which are good ones to watch and which ones not to watch. So, you know, the Russians even like this urban legend, but um, I can't track it down and prove it. I got a few things like that that are very hard to prove. Like the supposedly Stalin say, saying quantity has a quality of its own. I can't find anything like that, anywhere in Stalin's writings. You know, not that he didn't like numerical superiority, but again, these, these things get attributed. Then we'll call it an urban legend. <laughs> what is that? We'll call it an urban legend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the term does come into use at some point, and then it becomes you know, pretty common, um, and they kind of uh, reluctantly adopt it because that's how they're known and it makes them stand out. But you know, the, one, the people I talk to would roll their eyes and that. And, <laughs> But my question is always, how the hell would anyone know who's bombing you in the dark? And you know, it wasn't just them who did the low altitude, catch your engine, coast in. Uh, all those tactics were used by PO2s everywhere in the Soviet Air Force. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not to take away from them, but. Yeah, just uh, following up, I checked my friend Wikipedia, and uh, Jackie died at 74. And the name of her cosmetics company, Wings to Beauty. Wings to Beauty. Yeah, she actually flew around to advertise her stuff. You know, she'd take her plane around the country and it was painted up and stuff, and you know, that was kind of her advertising gig. She's very pretty. Other questions? There's also no truth to the rumor that Raskova was having an affair with Stalin. <laughs> I can't say you know, definitively, but it just seems highly unlikely. He didn't have affairs. <laughs> he didn't like women that much. Or men, for that matter. He just like, you know, killed his wives. There seems to be the same uh, prejudice. 
same problem of getting recognized as the women of practice? Yeah, it's infuriating, isn't it, that, you know, that we have to keep reinventing the wheel. And as a historian, you know, what I talk to my students about is, I'm not here to tell you whether you should think that women should fight, but I'm here to tell you what they have done. Because you can't make a decision on that unless you actually know the history of women in combat, and then make an informed decision about whether, you know, first you have to know whether they can fight, which I think has been pretty definitively proven. But why, why it's forgotten, you know, there's this cultural amnesia that just happens. I mean, I think part of it is the desire to, what did you fight for? We want to get back to the way things were before the war. Yeah. And so it's that snapback phenomenon of, you know, this kind of mythological good old days, and that didn't include all the changes that happened in the war. Just one thought. I think definitely we have that in America, right? Nobody's nostalgic for the mythical 50s. <laughs> you know, when no woman worked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, anything else, folks? <laughs>